the crypt. 13 blood-curdling tales from the crypt episodes that will give you nostalgic nightmares. Fans of horror have been blessed with an interminable number of scary movies and series over the years. Given the prolific nature of the genre, it often makes one wonder how Tales from the Crypt has managed to remain one of the most thriving horror anthology series to date. Based on the 1950s EC comic series of the same name, this darkly comedic anthology aired on HBO from 1989 to 1996, producing seven seasons and 93 episodes. Oh, Contraire, my friend. <laughs> Free. This series was indisputably famous for a lot of reasons. For starters, it pushed the margins of what mainstream television would normally allow, depicting a great deal of nudity, explicit violence, sex, and even much profanity. Another reason would be that the epic tales of the macabre were presented by the best and most memorable horror host ever, the Crypt Keeper. It is still so hard to let go of the image of that tiny, decayed man with his sarcastic sense of humor. He likes to unwind with a little red-hot poker. <laughs> So, as we gear ourselves up this year to celebrate the 32nd anniversary of Tales from the Crypt, we are going to revisit 13 of the most blood-curdling episodes of the series to give you all some very nostalgic nightmares. Are you ready, boils and ghouls? Before we get into the explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but means a lot to us. Thank you, let's begin. My dear Couch Potatoes is filed under T for television. Or should that be terror? Television terror. If you are ever given a chance to watch just a handful of Crypt episodes, do make sure that you pick this one. Directed by Charlie Perserni, with a screenplay by Randall Johnson and G.J. Prush, Television Terror is the 16th episode of the second season. The plot revolves around sleazy tabloid news anchor Horton Rivers, who attempts to score big ratings by leading an on-air tour of a spooky haunted house. But he soon comes face to face with the very real horror that he came to mock. The consistently threatening sense of danger and dread throughout this episode is bound to keep you right at the edge of your seats. While Horton investigates the house, there is a parallel flashback of the gruesome murder that had occurred there, a structure that is bound to be a delightful treat for all those horror hounds. You are immediately pulled into the tale, and the story moves at a lightning pace. From the graphic images of the bloodthirsty elderly ghost to the chainsaw-wielding specter pursuing Horton, things just keep getting better. How can you not love the part when Horton realizes that the person who was filming him in the last couple minutes was not his cameraman, but the ghost itself? The climax is undeniably explicit and brutal, featuring gruesome body horror detail and over-the-top slaughter. You name it, and this episode has it. On a more serious note, in its own way, this episode also sheds light on the reality television culture so prevalent in modern society, highlighting the significant issues of mass media manipulation, clouding the lines between what is real and what is not, and displaying how momentarily a thing fame truly is. Television Terror is a true classic of an episode and one that is highly recommended. What are you thinking about? My mother was right. Everybody's been right. Fuck you! The Ventriloquist Dummy. Directed by Richard Donner and penned by Frank Durabont, The Ventriloquist Dummy is the 10th episode of the second season. The narrative focuses on how an inspiring ventriloquist, Billy Goldman, desires to be like his idol, Mr. Ingalls, who currently lives in isolation after dropping out of show business because of a mysterious fire incident. It is only after tracking his childhood hero that Billy comes to know of the dark secrets behind Ingalls' talent. Believe me, 
I know what it's like when your whole life's dream crumbles like dust in your hand. Well, we all know how terrifying these dummies can be, especially with those soulless eyes gazing at you and the wooden mouths eerily opening. But hats off to this particular episode for bringing the dummy back to life in the most disturbing and gory manner possible. But I gotta chop you! I gotta uh, cut you in a steaming little piece! Stop! You can fight him, Mr. Eagles! You can fight him! When we say gory, we are specifically talking about moments like a person's arm being chopped off with a meat cleaver, or when a large mass of flesh is bitten out of someone's throat. There is more than a little blood spilled in this episode, which is good news for all the gore hounds out there. Whoa, 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 whoa. With its persistently brisk pace and solemn setting, its sick touches of pitch black humor and efficaciously grisly moments of explicit gore, you are going to love every part of this episode. And all the more so if you are a fan of evil dummies and mutant killer twins. Tim Shorsat's slick cinematography and Miles Goodman's shutterly background score combine to make something truly unforgettable. Mark our words when we say that this episode is worth your time and even worth the nightmares that will follow. Forever Ambergris. Well, if there is one episode of Tales from the Crypt that tops the terms of gross and gore, it may well be Forever Ambergris, the third episode of the fifth season which was directed by Gary Fledler and written by Scott Rosenberg. Roger Daltrey plays the role of a shady burnout war photographer, Dalton Scott, who is losing his touch and would do literally anything to get it back. The narrative revolves around how Dalton not only wishes to regain his former glory, but also that he hankers after his protege's lover. You little fuck. What? You play that all shucks thing just like a fucking pro. Rick Bota's cinematography deserves a special mention, giving this episode an incredibly polished look. Fans of the Tales from the Crypt series will love how the compelling story moves at a steady pace, keeping the grim and gritty environment in check, and crisply exploring themes like jealousy, commitment, treachery, and revenge. Jay Ferguson's rousing musical score hits all the right chords, leaving you wanting more. Uh, the uh, As for our favorite moments of gore, it is hard to forget the scene where Isaac, after getting infected in a germ-infested war zone, starts to decay and his eye actually falls out. There's plenty of bubbling and bursting of veins, blood gushing, and even someone's nose falling off their face. Trust us when we say that Forever Ambergris is unquestionably the most nauseating crypt episode, one that is filled with spectacularly insane visuals, black humor, and a great deal of nastiness. <laughs> <laughs> And all through the house. It is just plainly impossible to not mention this one. The second episode of the first season, which was directed by Robert Zemeckis and penned by Fred Decker. As good as the rest of the first season was, and all through the house might just be the best Tales from the Crypt episode of all time. Everything works in this episode's favor, from Mary Ellen Trainer's portrayal of the greedy philandering wife who has killed her husband, to Marshall Bell as her not-so-significant other, and even to Larry Drake as the creepy axe-wielding Santa, one with a particular fondness for slaughtering women. <laughs> A huge plus in this episode is that it wastes no time. A few seconds into the episode, the first brutal death takes place. The eerie stalking sequences are bound to make you look behind your sofa. And if that's not enough, the intensifying suspense and the narrative twist definitely will. <laughs> The episode captures the quintessential essence of classic Christmas cheer through beautiful, picturesque shots drenched in festive spirit.
highly decorated trees, roaring fires, and the holy music playing in the background. Everything gives a sense of warm security, but alas, the ideal picture does not really last long. Dean Cundy's cinematography combined with Alan Silvestri's unnerving, rousing score to further uplift the ghoulish tale. Watch this entry for its ending, one that is without a doubt exceedingly satisfying. Four-sided triangle. Remember the opening segment where the Crypt Keeper said, and we quote, Tale, a story of love and lurid lust in the dust. Well, that is exactly what this episode, the ninth episode of the second season, is all about. Directed and co-written by Tom Holland, the plot revolves around a young runaway, Mary Jo, who is held captive on an isolated country farm by the lewd George Yates, and his equally vicious wife, Louisa. Mary Jo appears to have lost her mind when she claims that the scarecrow in the field is alive and that she is in love with him. Mr. Yates, no! This here's my man. He's not real, Mary Jo. The strong and despotically grim rural setting holds the viewer's attention. And yes, you guessed it, there are a couple of ghastly scenes involving pitchfork impalement. But then again, the deaths are pretty satisfying. After all, bad things happen to bad people. And both George and Louisa are dreadful people who probably deserve much worse than what they got. The Chris cinematography of Paul Elliott deserves a mention, as does Scott Johnson's music score. True, there is not much gore here compared to other episodes, but then again, an ingeniously ambiguous twist pulls the story together in a climactic regard. Do not miss out on this guilty pleasure. ...who's about to make a grave mistake. I call it Death of Some Salesman. Death of Some Salesman. The first episode of season five starts out with a traditional gruesome bang. It would be an underestimation to presume that the seemingly quaint Brackett family are just a bit odd and an understatement to say that they can't turn down a bargain. Well, who knows this better than Judd Campbell? Posing as a salesman who tricks elderly people into buying cemetery plots, that in reality, does not exist. Little does Judd realize that he is not the first salesman to come knocking at the door of the Brackett house. His deceptive techniques hardly make an impression on his latest targets, who have a weird panache for disposing of salesmen using the very products they are trying to sell. This, it looks like the perfect place to spend eternity. It does look restful, doesn't it? It goes without saying that as Campbell, Ed Begley Jr. is a real treat to watch. But it's Tim Curry pulling triple duty as Ma Bracket, Pa Bracket, and their daughter Winona Bracket, who simply steals the show with the help of Todd Masters' mind-blowing makeup skills. You may not know this, but actor Eddie Murphy was also offered this role, but he turned it down and we are so glad that he did. <laughs> Salesmanship! <gasps> Where does this episode rank on the Gorometer? There's plenty of ghastly imagery, particularly of leftover parts of previous salesmen, and who on earth can forget that truly horrifying sex sequence? The way Winona mounts Judd like a walrus will crack you up, only initially though. As the scene continues, it may have you running towards the washroom. Mark our words, it is that disgusting. While John R. Leonetti's cinematography definitely deserves commendation, as does Michael Kamen's folksy musical score, full credit must go to director Gilbert Adler, who also co-wrote this script with A.L. Katz. Together, they deliver one hell of a surprise twist ending. You cannot miss this one. Do give it a shot. No, no, wait a second, easy. Jeez, aim that goddamn thing straight. Oh, don't worry. It don't hurt that bad. Cutting cards. The third episode of the second season revolves around a pair of hardcore gamblers, Sam and Reno, 
who don't play for fun and have been at each other's throats for many years. The duo challenge each other in a simple game of cards, but soon the competition becomes deadlier than you could ever have imagined. Your turn. Directed and co-written by Walter Hill, Cutting Cards moves along at a slick pace with commendable performances by Kevin Ty and Lance Hendrickson. The events of this episode are beyond insane. You want hardcore? Well, this is exactly what you get here. Three ladies, I feel great. I'm sorry I took so long to answer the question. Fingers are severed and cooked. And even after that, these guys just won't stop. You really won't believe what you are seeing here. Do believe us when we say that this episode will keep you glued to your seats. All it takes is just 20 minutes from your busy schedule to enjoy this dark comic piece. A twisted little classic. You fat son of a bitch! You can't do that to me! Don't you go. What's cooking? The sixth episode of the fourth season has just the right amount of gore for us. With some morbid black humor thrown in for good measure and some familiar faces playing unusual roles. Directed and co-written by Gilbert Adler, What's Cooking features the late Christopher Reeves as an unsuccessful restaurant owner with a huge debt to pay off and almost no customers wanting to purchase his squid-based dishes. However, Things change after a drifter and part-time busboy walks in with his own steak recipe. I can't believe you. I do you a favor and you call me a liar. For those who haven't guessed where these lip-smacking steaks come from, we might advise steering clear of this episode. A deliciously gruesome tale of cannibalistic urges, the episode moves along at a perfect pace, adding a hint of dark humor and a generous amount of gore. Remember the landlord's utterly mutated body in the freezer on display? Or that scene where someone hacks a huge chunk of flesh using a meat cleaver? When it comes to gore, what's cooking has it all. One other tiny little thing. You're one. Lousy cook. <laughs> it was an absolute treat to watch Reeves share the screen with rock and roll star Meatloaf and 80s icon Judd Nelson. Full credit must go to Adler for making perfect use of the wit of each of the leads and for giving the episode such a satisfying ending. <laughs> I call this little game of chops and clobbers carrion death. Carrion Death, the second episode of the third season, is a typical tale of terror written and directed by Stephen E. D'Souza. The narrative revolves around mass murderer Diggs, who is on the run attempting to flee across the Arizona desert towards the Mexican border. He is persistently pursued by a motorcycle cop until both of their vehicles are wrecked in a car crash. That does not stop the officer from continuing the chase on foot. <laughs> Diggs is eventually successful in killing the police officer, but only after being handcuffed to him. And do you know what's worse? The cop also swallowed the key to the cuffs before his demise. What follows is a slow and intense journey, as Diggs is left with no choice but to drag the dead body along with him across the desert all the while being stalked by a rather hungry vulture. It goes without saying that the vulture in the episode is an obvious depiction of the forthcoming presence of death. The vast barren desert effortlessly creates an isolating, uncomfortable sense of doom. Wanna dance? <laughs> the pictorial view literally plays with your mind. You can actually feel the heat, dirt, and weight of the corpse that Diggs is dragging along. Watch out for the gory ending. Trust us when we say that you really don't want to miss the scene where the vultures pluck out Diggs' eyes and start eating him. We highly recommend that you give this atmospheric tale of fate and revenge a shot. I just stopped in for a scoop. <gasps> I'm not really hungry. Morning Mess. The 10th episode of the third season centers around a journalist trying to solve the case of a mysterious serial killer. 
who has been murdering homeless people all across the city. But what he fails to understand is the conspiracy behind the murder and just how deep it goes. Penned and directed by Manny Koto, Morning Mess boasts a couple of macabre killings, a dark sense of humor, and a delightfully satisfying twist in the final act. One that is bound to keep your eyes glued to the screen. If you're hoping for gore, there's a lot on display here, including severed limbs, mutilated corpses, ripped off ears, and a hell of a lot of blood splatter. The set design definitely deserves a shout out, from the clandestine tunnels below the cemetery to the macabre and chic dining room. Everything compounds to create a highly unsettling vibe. Also, with big names like Steven Weber, Rita Wilson, Ali Walker, and the late Vincent Schiavelli, the episode showcases excellent star power, giving you all the more reason to make sure you watch. Split Second Directed by Russell Mulcahy and written by Richard Christian Matheson, the 11th episode of the third season centers around a beautiful waitress who ties the knot with the owner of a lumberjack company, but soon comes to the realization that he is not what she really wants. Things begin to turn bitter, especially in the bedroom, and eventually the wife becomes extremely bored, favoring promiscuity. She decides to seek excitement by seducing a new, handsome, young lumberjack. The insanely jealous husband, in a fit of rage, blinds the man. Though, they soon realize that what goes around, definitely comes around. Coupled together, the bang of pitch black humor with Brian May's shivering score and Rick Bota's cinematography, and this episode works wonders. Let him go, he was just kidding. Nobody kids about my wife. One of the best things about this tale is the late Byron James as the psychotically jealous lumberjack husband, simply stealing the show with his raged up role. The engrossing episode not only maintains a consistently brisk pace, but also provides some exotic visuals of the country backdrop. Split Second might not exhibit a lot of gore compared to other episodes of Tales from the Crypt, but there is an abundance of swearing, an appetizing topless scene, and of course, some blood splatter caused by a chainsaw. We will leave the rest to your imagination, but we sincerely request you do not miss out on this over-the-top gross ending. Mark our words, it is notably satisfying. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, I'm tired of the games. I want the tapes, and I want them now. Undertaking Parlor. A group of four adventurous teenage boys break into a local morgue as part of a prank, but stumble upon a devilish conspiracy of murder and greed. Apparently, the town's local mortician and the pharmacist have joined forces to increase the weekly number of funerals and split the profits. <laughs> My dad died last night. <laughs> what? However, when one of the boy's fathers dies from poisoned asthma medicine, the courageous teen squad decides to take the law into their own hands and expose the dastardly duo for their fiendish crimes. The ninth episode of the third season boasts an ingenious premise and overloads on macabre fun. Remember the scene where the mortician casually smashes the face of a corpse and then eats pizza over a cut open chest? If that's not enough, how about when the same guy listens to opera music and continues his gory job? <laughs> Undertaking Parlor features an abundance of effectively gross and ghastly instance of graphic gore, something that will be a sheer treat for all the horror hounds out there. The prevailing sense of dread inevitably makes the episode a winner. Director Michael Tao and writer Ron Finley should be congratulated on crafting something so brilliant. Also, thanks to Nicholas Pike for the shuddery background score. Watch it to experience it yourself. <laughs> 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 
abracadaver. Nothing could have stopped Martin Fairbanks from becoming a top-class surgeon had his brother Carl not played a stupid prank on him years ago. <laughs> My heart. Somebody call a goddamn ambulance now! Cut to present. Martin is just a research assistant and detests his brother, who turned out to be a successful surgeon. It goes without saying that Martin wants revenge and is also looking for a chance to prove the success of his research, which revolves around the human brain. It's too late for Carl to do anything about it, as his brother mixes his personal and professional goals. You can imagine how unsettling the end result might be. Wanna play doctor? Then open wide and say, ah! Directed by Stephen Hopkins and written by Jim Burge, the fourth episode of the third season effortlessly pulls off a brilliant, appropriate crypt ending. Do you believe us when we say that this episode is traumatic, bone chilling, and gory, and is quite capable of bringing back your worst nightmares? Abracadaver is one of those episodes that not only creeps up on you, but also grabs you and refuses to let go, even after the tale is over. You have to thank Alan Silvestri's moody background score for that. The mind-blowing performance by the two leads Bo Bridges as Martin and Tony Goldwyn as Carl also deserves a lot of credit. And it's weirdly satisfying to watch Bridges bring such sadistic relish to his role. The episode is hell-bent on making you squirm, so give it a shot right away, and you can always thank us later. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. So until next time, see you later, alligator. Ah!